Good evening, everybody. Sorry for the delay. My name is Andrew Karadowski. I'm the Vice President of the New York Chicago Association. Uh, as a person to be apologized for the courtesy of our President, my name is Kenneth Day. That is kind of speech in his behalf. Um, first, I'd like to tell that this is only one of the many events that we have going on this year. Um, we are trying to bring as many events to various regions of New York as year as possible. We spearheaded a new area to do smaller cross events in various regions. Uh, last week we did a highly successful uh, global problem social on that city of Long Island. Uh, and it's standing for severity, but I think it's here. But uh, it is uh, thank you again for helping us plan that. It was highly successful, very well attended, and I think everyone was there for free. Uh, two weeks ago, um, the April 10th, we also did a solar event in Pearl River. Uh, and again, we're going to be bringing solar events to various regions and various cities throughout the state. Uh, so to give everyone the opportunity to kind of in a very formal format, socialize and uh, see everyone that you work with on a daily basis. Um, we are doing a annual golf event on August 22nd up in Cicero, New York at the Lakeshore Yacht and Country Club. Uh, if you've been to any of our former um, golf events, I think you'll agree that they are extremely successful, very well attended. Uh, even with pouring rain, everyone ends up having a really good time. <laughs> Uh, but I definitely urge everybody to uh, sign up. It's already on the website. Uh, we are also going to be doing again a uh, wireless forum like we did last year here in New York City. Uh, again, Chelsea Piers, we have not have the date, but it will be in October sometime. And there will be additional information going out from your emails um, in the near future. Uh, I'd like to thank Stephen Banks. Stephen, are you? Thanks. In here? <laughs> there you go. Uh, there was some, uh, use, which I hope we're going to hear more about. 
Um, and that, you know, technology is very important in the challenging environments like we have in New York City and in solving the industry's capacity challenges. It's a key area of this research and something I, I think we will hear more about. Uh, Ted is also an inventor, an author, and a successful entrepreneur, having sold the business to what is now Comscope. Uh, finally, Ted is founding director of NYU Wireless, combining his research in the triangle of engineering, computer science, and, and medicine. He's a serial creator of these wireless research centers, having done so previously at the University of Texas and Virginia Tech. So you have Virginia Tech, you know, the Hokies, and the University of Texas, and the Longhorns. He's a graduate of Purdue the Boilermakers. So now he's with NYU, the Violets. He obviously didn't come here for the football, so. Ted? Thank you. I didn't come for the football. I came for the food. <laughs> it's it's very New York. I'm going to try to go mobile. See if this works. Uh, thank you very much, David, and thanks all for coming. Uh, I was asked to do this, and I'm really pleased to get to meet people in New York who are working in the wireless industry. I'm a professor, work with students and other faculty, and a number of industry partners, as you'll see. But being a professor, I really like hearing what it's like in the real world, and, and that's what we try to do in engineering. By the way, I am an engineer, so there are engineers here. We don't want to forget the engineers. I'll tell you what I've been engineering the last few years. It's what the future of wireless will be. And that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. I call it the renaissance of the wireless age, or the coming renaissance. Because when you look at wireless, it's 40 years old. Marty Cooper made the first cell phone call 41 years ago, about four blocks north of here, 10 blocks north in 1973, I guess. He made the first phone call by cellular, and 40 years ago he used a frequency of 800 megahertz. If you look at this chart, this is the spectrum in the United States, and each, each row of the chart is one decade or a factor of 10 in frequency. So the AM radio band is here from 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz. Here's 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Any ham radio operators in the audience? None? No hands? I'm the only one? Well, here's short wave. Morse code, those kinds of things. Uh, th 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz is where the FM radio band is. And in this line here, from 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz, is where cellular started. There's the 800 megahertz frequency that Marty Cooper used 41 years ago when the cellular revolution was born. By the way, you know it took about 12 years from that first phone call until the FCC finally figured out the duopoly issue and licensed it in the US. Well, Finland and Japan and the Nordic countries went way ahead of us. That's why Nokia and Ericsson really grew very rapidly and the US was kind of stalled. It took us 12 years to get the regulatory framework, the duopoly system for cellular. But this is where the frequencies of cellular started. Then PCS came in 95, all in this 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz range. Wi-Fi here at 2.4 gigahertz. Yet in 40 years, the entire history of the wireless world while clock speeds in our computers have gone up by five or six orders of magnitude, while memory sizes have gone up seven orders of magnitude. Remember the old memories in the early PCs, kilobytes, megabytes, now we talk about gigabytes and terabytes. Clock speeds in the early PCs in the 1980s were two megahertz, now they're two gigahertz. That's you know huge orders of magnitude. In all these 40 years, our frequencies that we use in wireless have only moved at most by a factor of three, from 800 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. This is astounding. And what's about to change is the fact that integrated circuits and research by chip companies have now figured out how to make integrated circuits and transmitters and receivers that operate at much higher frequencies. That is, finally, Moore's law has hit the wireless world and moving our carrier frequency up from today's cellular frequencies up to this band from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. 30, three, 30 gigahertz is 10 times where cellular and PCS operate today. Now to put this into perspective of what this rise in frequency will do, 
all of this blue shaded area, shortwave, AM, FM, TV, cable, cellular, PCS, Wi-Fi, all of the bandwidth we've ever known in the history of the wireless world, all fits within this tiny little blue circle at a frequency of 60 gigahertz. 60 gigahertz is the unlicensed spectrum that's been available for 10 years. And finally, you're going to start to see integrated circuits, chips, shipping in computers within the next quarter or two. They're already shipping in gaming equipment. Where radio systems operating in this millimeter wave band can carry all the information ever carried on a signal in the history of wireless. We're going to see a sea change in bandwidth and content in wireless like we've never seen. So this, I believe, is going to open up wireless to finally be pervasive in everything we do. And really, it begins to start changing the way paper and pencil came into society. We've moved away from pencil and paper, and we're becoming more paperless. This is what's going to create a true wireless future, where everything we have in our home, in our businesses, our clothing, will be connected wirelessly with data content never before fathomed. Now, there's a myth in the wireless world. Engineers for, for decades have thought this is impossible. You can't use this millimeter wave spectrum. You know, think about it. The, the size of radio waves, you know, the cell phones are about this big, and that's about a quarter wavelength for, you know, today's cellular LTE systems. But the wavelength up at millimeter wave frequencies becomes the size of a fingernail. So the, and, and if, if, in fact, if you go up to much higher frequencies, here, here's where we are today, zero to a few gigahertz in frequency. This is where all cellular and Wi-Fi and public radio work, public service, private radio. The attenuation is very small, very small oxygen attenuation. And there's a myth that when you go up to millimeter wave frequencies, all of a sudden you can't go very far. Well, that's true at 60 gigahertz, where the wavelength's about the size of your fingernail. But that's just a small resonance because of the size of an oxygen molecule. Turns out there are other frequencies up at 80 gigahertz, 220 gigahertz, up in the millimeter wave bands, where oxygen attenuation is not a problem at all. So that's one myth that the industry has always held. But then there are other frequencies, such as at 380 gigahertz, where the wavelength's the size of a human freckle. Think about that, wavelength the size of a human freckle, which means you could build antennas with hundreds, thousands of antenna elements on a cell phone or on a portable device. And you can make basically, you've heard of the very large array out in Arizona that looks into deep space astronomy. How many have heard of that? Well, that's what's going to be coming to our cell phones over the next decade. Cell phones with antennas with hundreds of elements that can steer the energy and beam and bounce off of windows and street signs and creating energy. You see, when you get up to frequencies this high, you can start pinpointing the energy with very, very large arrays, which are physically very small, thereby getting a lot of gain, kind of like laser pointers on all the cell phones. So this debunks one of the myths that atmosphere will stop millimeter waves. And the FCC in Europe and now countries around the world have seen this, and they've allocated these huge amounts of spectrum, five gigahertz of spectrum. That's more than anything we've ever had in the whole history of wireless, everything put together is now available for transmission and reception, license free. And these products will be shipping by the millions. If you've heard of wireless HD or YGIG or IEEE 802.11.80, these are the new standards that will make multi-gigabit per second data transfers available. In fact, the products exist today. And governments around the world have all ratified this, so that makes an international marketplace which allows products to grow the same way Wi-Fi did in the early 2000s. Now, I said the chips are small. These are examples of chips that we've built. You can now put entire radios with antennas, lots of antennas, on a single integrated circuit. So what would you use all this bandwidth for? I mean, when you go up high in frequency, by definition, you get a commensurate increase in bandwidth. And that's the key. By going up to millimeter wave frequencies, you get huge amounts of bandwidth. What can we use it for? Well, one of the problems carriers face today is backhaul. In fact, backhaul, getting from the base station back to the switches, is one of the most expensive problems. There's site act. That's, of course, tough. Site acquisition. It takes a long time to get zoning and not in my backyard problem solved. But equally as costly to the carrier is finding where the cable is buried, getting to the high-speed port. Well, if you have all this bandwidth available, you can imagine very light iron, low cost, rapidly deployable backhaul millimeter wave radios. That's already a growing 
but fledgling market. But when you get up to these millimeter wave bands, uh, and as costs come down, you could have wireless backhaul using the same frequencies that are used to provide mobility. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The uh, uh, other possibility, and already some of the large companies in the world are starting to look at this, is mobility, connected mobility. We already have 77 gigahertz radar integrated circuits in, in high-end vehicles. You know, the automatic backing, lane change. All that's radar with adaptive antennas. So the technology exists. Uh, sc beam scanning. But now you can imagine massive data rate transfers, movies, download movies on the fly as you drive by a toll booth or drive by an exit. Information content will be delivered in such a different way. I mean, this is a new world when you start opening up this bandwidth. Information showers. You know, I look at the students at NYU. They come to class with backpacks. But there's no reason why they couldn't just have a small portable device and when they walk in the door, the information shower transmits huge gigabytes of information of all the books they'd ever need to take and will take during their whole college career. <coughs> so the idea of pervasive information is huge. And then the computer, this laptop that I brought, you know, it has a hard drive inserted with it. It has a keyboard, it has a CPU, but there's no reason that memory couldn't be on a credit card or my memory couldn't go with me. And that where we go, all of our content goes with and then it makes a little wireless connection to whatever computer we're near. So this will decentralize computing. <coughs> and we're already looking at doing this in data centers. This is something that shows the, the um, real motivation for data centers, computer makers, to try to move to wireless. It kind of shows wireless starting its renaissance, where it pervades everything we do. This shows a one watt power budget <coughs> and how a 10 meter link in a data center uh, that you could actually spend one watt and do a transmitter and receiver and carry the same amount of information as today's fiber and optical cables that are being used in the Yahoo, Google, Microsoft uh, data centers that they build around the, the world to try to get the internet content closer to users. And not only that, this is about two orders of magnitude less expensive if you could do it wireless in silicon. So there's huge interest in this area. It's, it's Still very nascent, but it's coming very rapidly. Now, one of the key things is building the transmitters and receivers, uh, getting the frequency sources. But one of the things we've looked at, because you have to start with the antenna, and then you have to understand the channel. So antenna and propagation is one of the areas I do research in. We decided to take a look at how to build on-chip antennas. This is work about four years ago when I was at University of Texas. Austin, hook them, hook them horns. Uh, the football was very good there, I must say, under Mac Brown. Yeah, better than NYU. Uh, although the football at Virginia Tech's also very good. And one of the best things I did when I was a faculty member there is I got season tickets, because I love college football. And I never sold my season tickets, I always kept them, even when the Hokies were terrible. So when they got good, I still had great seats, even when I went to Texas. I still don't miss a home game at Virginia Tech. I, I, I really love getting there. So uh, yeah, we've got to work on the football in New York. But we have great pro teams. So we, we decided to look at uh, on-chip antennas. And uh, making these is not that hard. But making them work well is hard. Because to put an antenna on chip, antennas like to be out in the air. They like to breathe. They like to naturally be with air. They don't want to be put onto an integrated circuit. Integrated circuit and casing sucks energy away. So the trick is how can you make antennas work well in a, in a new format that wasn't made for antennas, it was made for circuit boards, it was made for devices. Well, it turns out you can do this. Let me tell you about an integrated circuit because many of you might not know it. It's kind of interesting to know what's in all of our electronics. Every circuit, every integrated circuit that's in our cell phone or computer is basically about 750 microns thick tiny. But all the transistors and all the wires that connect all the transistors together on this tiny 10 micron level. So all the stuff that makes everything work is on a tiny 10 micron level. I mean, that's, that's tiny. And there are six layers of conductors that are all connected, like tiny circuit boards all in our integrated circuits. So all the magic happens in this 10 microns above 
the bulk silicon. And companies like TSMC and UMC and TI and Intel have these giant factories that are one mile long. They're called foundries. We have one of the best foundries in the world up in upstate New York with global foundries uh, with the big nanotech initiative. And these one mile long factories basically are taking big pieces of silicon and putting little metal layers on it and putting chips on it. That's how our electronics work. The trouble when you put an antenna on these metal is it wants to go into the silicon. The energy wants to go there and not go out towards the other radio or to the base station. So what can you do to overcome it? Well, a lot of researchers around the world have been looking at this for a while. The trouble is you get terrible efficiency. You lose you know, 49 out of 50 watts goes into the substrate and you only get 2% out. So early work showed that this is very hard. And uh, you know, people worked on this stuff. How do you put it in silicon? Eventually, we figured out that, hey, we'll go back to an old ham radio trick. I was hoping there would be some amateur operators in the room that knew HF, because this antenna, the rhombic, was invented in 1931. It's how Voice of America and shortwave stations around the world and military stations before the invention of satellite would talk to each other around the world. They used very directional large wire antennas. This is the rhombic. And no one had ever thought of this before, maybe because there aren't a lot of hams doing this, but I thought, what if we put a rhombic on an integrated circuit, you know, a super highly directional antenna? And the nice thing about millimeter waves is, is while rhombics are several miles long at HF, high frequency in the 30 megahertz band, Huge rhombics are only millimeters long at millimeter wave frequencies. And so we built this uh, rhombic antenna, which is basically a diamond of metal put on an integrated circuit, and wound up breaking the record for antenna gain. And it turns out we could get very good efficiency. Not a lot of gain. This is basically an omni. It's, it's not much gain. It's 0.2 dBi. So it's, it's not terribly doesn't have a great deal of gain because we're still losing a lot of power in the substrate, but the antenna actually makes up for that by its size. And so we were able to get a some front to back ratio and basically show that if you work hard enough, you might be able to make these antennas work. Now, since this work, other people like IBM have figured out clever ways to notch out air holes in an integrated circuit. And so there's many more advances in the last few years. But this shows that we'll solve the on-chip antenna problem so that your future wireless device will have antennas built into the circuits. Right now, your antennas in your cell phone are put on the circuit board. When you have your laptop, you move your laptop display. There's lots of little cables and wires connecting antennas. They'll all be integrated in the future. So I talked about this huge spectrum availability. What will what will happen above three gigahertz? Will it happen and will it work? Well, I'm here to tell you happily, yes, it will. This is where our huge bandwidth will come. Let's first look at what past work has, has been done at looking at these millimeter wave frequencies for cellular, for outdoor connectivity. You know, we, you, the, uh, the Wi-Fi, 802.11ad, Ygig, wireless HD, those products exist now for indoor, and you'll be hearing a lot more about 60 gigahertz over the next year or two. You'll be seeing ship in all your laptops and cell phones in the next one to two years. But what about outdoors? What about cellular outdoor? I already showed you that the attenuation in oxygen is not a big deal. That's a myth that, that we debunked. Well, it turns out that in the 1980s, the NTIA did a study of foliage with antennas through leaves and not surprisingly found out that millimeter waves are very lossy, okay? So they're lossy and trees are not good for it. And then when the LMDS license uh, fiasco happened in the late 1990s, anyone remember that, 28 gigahertz? Reed Hunt was gonna deregulate the last mile for local exchange carriers and wow, a lot of money spent on um, building up this millimeter wave vision at LMDS and then the dot bomb happened and you know it all went away. But there are all these licenses at 28 and 39 gigahertz, huge bandwidths sitting there waiting. But the work in the LMDS world in the 1990s showed that this was the perception that you really can't make outdoor millimeter wave work. You know, this paper by Scott Seidel, one of my grad students who went on to work at Belcor, 
he said you only get 70% um, you can only make a you, you can only get 30% if your antenna is low. In other words, you don't get or not receive signals at 70% within two kilometers. And within one kilometer, half the time, you don't get a signal. So this was pretty discouraging. You know, if half the time within a kilometer you can't get a signal, will it ever work? Well, remember, this is the 1990s when cell sites cellular radius were five kilometers or ten kilometers. Now in New York, you know what our cell radius is in New York City? It's a few hundred meters, right? It's 200, 300 meters. This idea of small cells, it has to, it's done that way in large m metropolitan areas simply because they need the capacity. So that looked terrible and the whole industry thought this is terrible, it'll never work. Half the time at a kilometer, you know, 30 percent, you know, outage 70 percent of the time at two kilometers. And then people said, rain, rain is bad. You know, from the satellite industry, rain is terrible. We all know that if we watch satellite TV. During the, during the cocktail hour, I'll tell you a funny story about a Virginia Tech football game this past year, watching it in a bar with satellites. Anyway, rain outages are real. But what's remarkable is if you look at this graph, once you get to about 100 gigahertz, it doesn't matter how heavy it rains, there's a constant attenuation versus rain, which means rain is very well understood. And furthermore, this is in decibels per kilometer. If you're talking about decibels per 100 meters, you divide it by 10. So the point is rain is not an issue if you're talking about 200, 250, 400 meter cell radii. It's a few dB. And when you get the antennas so small, you can make very highly directional antennas and you can easily compensate for a few dB of loss with a little bit more antenna gain. So this was a wonderful uh, revelation that people had not been thinking about. Small cells combined with the fact that millimeter waves give you much more antenna dimensionality. So we made some of the first measurements in the world at um, millimeter wave frequencies, first in Texas, and we've been measuring New York since I got here in 2012. And the industry is starting to follow these measurements and now using it to develop future uh, wireless modems. Uh, I'll skip this graph other than to say that this is how received power uh, works in the real world. This is the transmitter receiver separation in meters. So there's 10 meters, there's 100 meters, there's a kilometer. And here's uh, received signal levels at all the locations that we measured. And I'll show you some of the equipment we built, we built our own equipment and are now helping other universities and companies build it. And this shows line of sight, and it obeys a free space path loss of two, an exponent of two, or d squared. Radio energy falls off as distance squared. But when you get into non-line of sight, and there's blockage, it falls off about distance to the third power to distance to the fourth power. So the point is, this is not very different than today's cellular. We also made a bunch of measurements on how multipath the energy that bounces around building, how that behaves. And this all came from work that we did in the 1990s in indoor before 60 gigahertz, where we saw that when you were indoors, you could always find a few distinct locations where energy would come. That is, if you had antennas that could properly point their beams, you could make links no matter where you were. And if people were blocking you, your wireless modem could quickly change and move an antenna and connect somewhere else. So from the indoor world of the 1990s and early 2000s, and now this is being done commercially in the indoor Wi-Fi chips, the wi wireless HD, y gig chips, uh, we decided could this work outdoors? Could you make it work for the cellular uh, environment of the future? So we built this equipment, we built our own circuit board, students built it, we built this measurement cart, and we have uh, mechanical rotators so you can rotate these antennas. And since we don't yet uh, know how to build these phased arrays. It's very expensive. It's too hard for a university to do. Samsung has built some. Other companies are working on it. We took an easy way out. We just got horn antennas that are directional. We rotated them because we said, we know that we'll be able to d build these wireless antennas on phones of the future. But we're not going to build it now. We're just going to use horn antennas. And these horn antennas rotating will emulate or be like what future phone antennas will do. That allowed us to get out into the field and measure. And we built this transmitter and receiver, a spread spectrum system, 
uh, world's fastest spread spectrum channel sounder with a one gigahertz RF bandwidth. So we go out, go out and send this very, very broadband channel sound, sounding signal all over. And so here are the results of the world's first outdoor 5G. I call it 5G. We're building out 4G now, LTE, right? Long-term evolution. Cellular carriers are gonna spend tens of billions of dollars on 4G. That'll get us up to hundreds of megabits per second of data, but we're now calling this 5G. We think millimeter wave frequencies is where you'll go from hundreds of megabits to tens of gigabits per second of data for your cell phone in the coming decade. So we made measurements in Texas at 38 and 60 gigahertz. We then came to New York City and measured 28 and 73 where we're continuing to do that. Basically that whole millimeter wave band we're studying and showing the world that it will work. And uh, this is peer-to-peer -peer or device-to-device -device measurements. It turns out that fences, lamp posts, garbage cans, all of these things are very reflective. In fact, you and I are very reflective. We have a reflection coefficient of about one half, which means a quarter of the power bounces off you and I when a millimeter wave signal uh, comes along, which is pretty good. We're reflective. We keep the energy in play, which means we'll be able to communicate very well with millimeter waves. And we measured around the campus and measured all over the uh, property and you can see that what the system looks like. And the bottom line is we found that this stuff works. I'll skip the data. If you're an engineering geek like me, and by the way, any double E's in the room? E-E? -E? Good. You can't be a geek without double E, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we made these great measurements and found out voila, that within 200 meters, we never had an outage. That is, millimeter waves work within 200 meters everywhere. This is an important result because we then came to New York City, and this is at Brooklyn, and we went to NYU's downtown campus where they've given us access to all the rooftops, and so we've been deploying base stations and measuring the channel, and here are some of the students. This is on top of Rogers Hall at NYU Poly. And uh, this is what the cart looked like in 2012. This is our receiver. Now someday this giant rack of equipment will be a cell phone. But right now it's this giant rack of equipment and you can see the rotating antenna is here. And the students are logging the data here, collecting the first measurements of millimeter wave uh, <coughs> propagation. This is on the Stearns Business School with the transmitter. And uh, it's a lot of work, it's hard work. We do it every summer. And, uh, but, but this is how wireless systems of the future are invented. And uh, they need the knowledge to be able to build the radios to understand what the channel is. So here we are, uh, NYU uh, housing. And so we're measuring all around this urban environment, collecting data and measuring indoors to outdoor. And uh, this is where the, there was a fire alarm and my students were in there measuring and I was worried because I thought they were going to get trapped. <laughs> they, were, they were making the measurements and the fire department came and uh, they were fine. It was a false alarm. We get a lot of looks taking this equipment out around the streets of New York City. But, <laughs> but luckily the NYPD have befriended us and New York Public Safety is wonderful. NYU works it out and now the police know us. But uh, we, the students r run into some, some crazy people as you can imagine. Let me show you what the channel looks like. And this is pretty exciting. When you point an antenna to the receiver, that is if the base station to mobile has a very direct line, you get this perfect single response. There's no multipath. You get a perfect shot, free space, wonderful signal. But now if I turn my receiver antenna just about 30 degrees, I get all this multipath. I get all this energy scattering from the sides of buildings. This is very interesting because it's unlike what we have in today's cellular. It turns out that this scattering effect is going to allow the channel to work very well. And so we studied uh, these channels and found out <clears throat> that indeed there's always about three different angles that wherever you are in a street, even with a non-line of sight condition, and we mainly measure non-line of sight, that is a transmitter that you can't see, that if you look at three unique angles, you'll find energy. You can even combine this energy. So we published these results last year in a paper called It Will Work, and uh, it's generated a lot of interest. Right, these are the world's first measurements that show millimeter wave is not only viable, 
but it will work really well and the data rates will go up so high and this will be the way carriers address the huge increase in data demand. So it's very early days. Our work in New York City showed that 200 meter cells will also work at 28 and 73 gigahertz. So that seems to be the magic number, 200 meter cells, and the industry's going that way anyway. And uh, so it's, it's really one of the frontiers. It's generated a lot, of work, uh, a lot of interest. And these are some of the companies working on the 60 gigahertz indoor products. That s How many people have already heard about 60 gigahertz? Already heard about Ygig and wireless HD? A couple people have heard about it. We're all going to be hearing about it in the next two years. Remember when you first heard about Bluetooth? Right? Everyone's heard of Bluetooth, right? Well, you'll be hearing about this stuff in a couple years, the way you heard about Bluetooth about five or six years ago. Um, so, I call this the wireless coming into its renaissance. How do, we, how do we bring this renaissance about? So, one of the ways is future generations of engineers. These are our students at NYU Wireless. NYU Wireless is a research center I started in 2012. We're about a year and a half old. Um, it's one of the fastest growing academic research centers in the country in any discipline. And it's due to the hard work of these students and faculty. And I just wanted to share in closing what's happening at NYU Wireless, our research center at NYU. Um, as, uh, as David mentioned, I, I like building research centers. I'm kind of a serial social entrepreneur. Now, I did this at Virginia Tech in the early days of cellular. And then I did it at UT Austin when Telecom Corridor was moving to Dallas. And then NYU got, got me to come help get the merger done with Brooklyn Poly and, and NYU. And that's been very exciting. But we have a world-class med school at NYU, and the docs have been great. You know, doctors are really just engineers that like to work on people instead of circuits and radios. So, I mean, we talk the same language, except they use long words that have to do with blood flow. And I use long words that have to do with radio propagation. But we get along great, and we're actually working together. And I wanted to... Ohm's law. <laughs> they know Ohm's law, and I Ohm's law. You know, the docs know Ohm's law pretty well. Um, it's remarkable. So I wanted to show you what's happening at NYU Wireless, uh, because it's, it's, it's very exciting. And it's a great resource for, for New York, for New York State, and for the city. So NYU Wireless is a center with 25 faculty and 100 students. It started in... Uh, August of 2012, so we're about a year and a half old. We just had our first board meeting with our industrial affiliates. We have a number of companies that pay money, $100,000 a year. They put two people on the board, and we have a very deep dive relationship with these companies. It includes electrical and computer engineering, computer science, and radiology. And here are the faculty. There are docs, there are experts in computers, there's imaging. There's a large number of uh, uh, different disciplines. The inventor of the modern MRI, Dan Sodickson, in the radiology department is here. Uh, Dennis Shasha wrote puzzles for, I think, New Yorker magazine. Uh, I mean, there's just some remarkable people here. I, I think I got the magazine wrong, but he, Scientific American, maybe. But here are our industrial affiliate sponsors, and we've grown very quickly. Uh, we have 10 industrial affiliates. Samsung followed me from Texas, and so did National Instruments. Uh, and we've worked very closely with them and all these other companies to start pioneering this millimeter wave future. Because these companies and the whole industry are going to need new engineers that understand this world of millimeter wave. It's not taught in schools. It's a new frontier. It's a totally new technical area where the wavelengths get small, new laws, new concepts. You really have to worry about things that you didn't have to worry about as an engineer at, at lower frequencies. And so we have uh, very deep involvement with the, with the uh, uh, representatives from the companies. The students have great facilities. We built out a world-class research lab. You can see some of it here. And uh, just about NYU, you know, it's, it's appropriate that we have a leading wireless center, a telecom center, because Samuel Morse, the inventor of the Morse code, was our first professor. He was a left brain, right brain guy. He was a great American artist and inventor of the telegraph, at least in the US. Siemens invented it in Europe, and Morse invented it in the US. So he was the first professor at NYU, so it's appropriate we'd be good in, uh, in telecommunications. Let me show you some of the press that we've been getting. Um, when we first published this paper uh, called uh, 
5G, it will work. It immediately went to the top of the most cited technical papers in all the world. Uh, last year it was in the 36th. As of last month it was first in the world. So engineers around the world are reading this paper and see it's called millimeter wave for cellular. It will work. So we've shown it will work. Um, and just last week we had our board meeting and recruiting day. It was very exciting. Uh, I'll show you what we did uh, for recruiting. You know, the students were looking for jobs. We have all the industrial affiliates come. We show them posters. Uh, you know, they get a lot of, lot of good time with the, uh, with the experts from industry. And then we just had our Brooklyn 5G Summit. This was a worldwide event that I did with one of our industrial affiliates, Nokia Solutions and Networks, NSN. Uh, we, it was really interesting. We co-created we, we co 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 it. I had the idea. Nokia Siemens wanted to sponsor it. They paid for everything. They brought in... Uh, their CTO and brought in a lot of key industry leaders. I brought academic leaders. I also brought some industry people and they brought some academics. And we all know each other now. We had this great summit last week. Um, we had a welcome address by Hossein Moyn, who's the CTO of NSN. And uh, John Stanky, the president of AT&T, head of strategy, came, spent a, a, you know, a full half day with us, which is a lot for the president of AT&T. And uh, Michael Ha, the deputy director of FCC, Office of Engineering Technology spent the entire time there, you know, for someone from the FCC to spend two days. And on stage during his talk, he publicly announced that, and this had not been announced till our summit, that the FCC will be opening up response for comments, requests for comments for millimeter wave spectrum in the United States the third or fourth quarter of this year, which is quite, quite a statement. Uh, we had a number of academic and industry uh, people giving talks. And we also invited exhibitors that are making some of the early prototypes of test and measurement equipment for this new future of millimeter wave. And you can see some of the exhibits here. We had Intel demonstrating their future chips that they're going to be shipping in two quarters for YGIG. And uh, we had uh, InterDigital and Rodian Schwartz and Agilent. And we had our own channel sounder on display. It was really, really a lot of fun. And a surprise gift was I have a textbook coming out. It's the first textbook in the world called Millimeter Wave Wireless Communications that I wrote with colleagues at UT Austin. And Agilent Technologies bought a free copy for everybody. So they gave out this teaser chapter. So that was kind of nice. Everyone left. And by the way, no one had to pay a thing for this. NSN paid for all the costs, and all they had to do was get there. So we had people from all over the world, and it was really a lot of fun. We had Docomo's CTO. Uh, Docomo is one of the biggest carriers in Japan. It's the AT&T equivalent in Japan. And we also had uh, really started the uh, discussion about making standards that would lead to these future uh, cellular type uh, millimeter wave systems. I wanted to share this video with you because it's quite stunning. Samsung introduced it just last week. And I don't know if we can dim the lights, but this, is, this will be worth uh, taking a look at if we can. So this is what we could look forward to in the future. Recently, millimeter wave technologies have drawn keen interest as a method to support explosively expanding wireless data traffic. Can you hear it?
Did you hear that? Four gigabits per second with a one gigahertz bandwidth. And four, four gigahertz is not, um, that's not bad for full mobility. So um, <laughs> you think about that. Think about how much information that is. So, uh, you know, this is in the early days. Uh, you can see there's research going on. We're, uh, we're active in this area. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to garner a lot of support and now we're showing that it's real. <clears throat> and uh, there's been, been a lot of nice press. Fortune ran a nice story this week on the, uh, on the event. And here, I cheerfully say it's a pre-competitive stage where industry is sharing and that's really true. And the uh, Fortune writer says, once the first product rolls off the production line though, it's game on. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's true. So it is still early days, but it's a time to be generating the future engineers that are gonna be able to go to these companies and make the products. Microwave Journal had a nice article where they uh, basically said, we ran a great inaugural event that attracted the best minds in the industry on the potential of 5G. And, uh, we're gonna, and then uh, Andrea Goldsmith at Stanford, she came and uh, technically covered this. And basically we talked about the Internet of Things where 50 billion, 50 billion devices will be sharing information through the cloud. You're gonna need bandwidth to do that and millimeter wave looks like it'll provide the bandwidth. So in conclusion, it's going to be a massively broadband era. It's not yet, but when it comes wireless will obviate print magnetic media wired connections, it'll really bring wireless to its renaissance. It took about 30 years to go from one decade in frequencies from 450 megahertz to five gigahertz. It's amazing, it took that long for Moore's law to hit the carrier frequency of wireless, but we're about to explode. We're about to see the carrier frequencies go up in wireless. Uh, it's a rich field and I think uh, it'll be exciting to see where this goes in the next decade. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have time for questions? Uh, you know, if anyone has a burning sure. question before we... Yes. Yeah. So, in phased array, you, you, you feel that they'll become spherical in nature on a phone, and, and as such, because now you have a spherical device, right, so you're looking in all directions, what does that do for battery, you know, power consumption right. versus advances in battery and power? Great question about the phased array, what will it look like? It's interesting. Uh, you can make phased arrays that are very flat. In fact, Samsung showed a 32 element flat antenna on the edge of cell phones. So you can actually get almost 360 degree coverage just with something flat. You change the phases and create that. Although we also saw on display a spherical lens. So base stations might actually be spherical and have little lenses behind. Uh, so th they'll take many different form factors. But this is not a hard problem to solve theoretically. It's a hard problem to solve practically, to drive the costs down to pennies. Not dollars, but pennies. That's the hard part. Phased arrays have been used in the military for decades. We know how to do it. It's just putting them into consumer electronic form faster, factors inexpensively. That's the challenge and a lot of companies are working that right now. Other questions? No other questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it on the website, NYU Wireless. You know, no one asked about health effects. Usually I get a question about health effects. Yeah, let me talk to you about that, because I'm working on that with the medical. No, it's, it, you know, what's interesting is that the, these are still non-ionizing frequencies. We're still like eight orders of magnitude below ionizing frequencies. X-rays, gamma rays, they're ionizing. These are non-ionizing. So the only health effects at millimeter wave, just like with cellular, are really heat. And so their standards, right now they don't go up to these millimeter wave frequencies, but their standards in Europe and the FCC here in the US that determine exposure limits based on how hot your temperature rises. The human body, you can generally sense if temperature goes up uh, uh, you know, a fraction of a degree Celsius. You can feel it. And so, uh, you know, our early work at this, and I have a PhD student looking at it, is that health effects are not going to be an issue. In fact, for power levels and the antennas that we contemplate, there's not going to be any, any issue at all 
compared to the regulations we have now at lower UHF and uh, microwave. So that the early news is good, but we're working on that. It's one of the nice things about having a med school. Yeah. How about from an aesthetic level, what are the antennas going to look like? Great question. Aesthetic level. You know, this is a big deal. Right now, people talk about massive MIMO. Has anyone heard of massive MIMO? Massive multiple input, multiple output. Theoretically, it turns out if you can make a very large antenna manifold and put it on a building, you can get great capacity. The trouble is, people don't want big, ugly antennas on the sides of buildings. But when you go to millimeter waves, the wavelengths shrink. So now you can have massive antennas that are like the size of a ceiling tile or the size of a brick. So up at millimeter wave frequencies, you're going to get huge gains with, this, with antennas that are much more aesthetically pleasing, with much less wind load, because physically they're going to be smaller. So uh, that's, that's good news, I think. Millimeter wave makes a lot of sense in small cells, because you get a lot of gain for a given area up at these higher frequencies. Yes? Security. You know, one thing that I think will help as we go to these higher frequencies and use directional beams is it will now be harder to intercept. If you put energy into narrow beams, that's much tougher to intercept or eavesdrop than the omnidirectional cell phone antennas we use today. So that'll, that'll kind of be a free benefit in this spatial, spatial world. Yes? What you described is, is primarily at the, at the urban market, right? Yes. Do you see any use for it in the uh, outside of the community? Really good question. question. What we've been talking about is the urban market. That's where the huge capacity demand is. I think it's going to be tougher to justify this in the rural markets. Rural markets, you tend to have less built up uh, structures. And part of the key to making millimeter wave work is going to be able to bounce off buildings and kind of use the structures to keep things in play. If it's a bunch of crop canopies, farm fields, the energy will dissipate. That's, that's my gut feel. Now, no one's, measured, no one's measured in the rural markets. It may turn out that crop canopies are great uh, scatterers and reflectors. No one studied that. You know, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if scattering keeps energy in play remarkably well, just from what we've seen in New York. But uh, my, my hunch is it'll be much harder to make this work in the room. Yeah, the distances are small, so the capital expenditure will be hard to justify out there in, in, in rural areas. The capacity demand is usually not as great because the density of people isn't as great. Well, I was thinking about sort of engineering thing, sort of a remote sensor network. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes? What about the coexistence and migration from the current? cellular bands in the, in the end user handsets with the new technology, can they coexist together or will they yeah. affect each other? Great, Great question. question. I'm sure there will be a uh, roadmap that allows them to coexist. Uh, it, they're not going to throw out the 4G LTE huge infrastructure investment. So in fact at our meeting at the Brooklyn 5G Summit there were actually discussions about a roadmap that would introduce millimeter wave as a extension and part of the current 3G PP standard setting process. So I'm sure you'll see a natural migration, just the way Wi-Fi is including uh, YGIG into its, and, and 802.11ac into its framework. So that devices will be backward compatible as well as uh, upward compatible. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
State Wireless Association or uh, PCIA, but then it deals with specifically with 5G. So you pretty much heard it here first. I'm going to see you fit into one of Professor Applewood's uh, other symposiums or uh, seminars. So again, more round of applause. Banks, who is not in here right now from AMB for helping organize this. He asked me to invite everybody to a one hour old bar up on the rooftop, again sponsored by Bill's Lego, and I look forward to seeing you all there. Anybody want to talk about this?